welcome to Leading Edge. I'm Tim Miller in for Jerry Anderson this week. So glad you are joining us. Well, have you noticed it? Maybe you're sick of it. All that construction on Interstate 75 going into Toledo or south of Toledo. Well, we thought it was time to give you an update on how the project is going. So joining me here today is Pat McCauley. He is a district deputy director for ODOT. Pat, thank you so much for joining us here on Leading Edge. I understand this is actually two projects on I-75 to the average driver, it may seem like just one, right? Uh, yeah, thanks Tim for having me and thank you WTUL for having me. But you're right, it does seem like one project going on on I-75, so this has been uh, uh, ongoing for a number of years, but there's actually two separate projects. One's from Buck, Ave Buck Avenue to South Avenue and the other's from South uh, all the way to Door Street. So those are the two separate projects and there's definitely uh, some major components in both of those. The north one is starting to wrap up. The south one we're still going to be dealing with for a little while. And kind of in the middle of that maybe is the DeSalle Bridge, which you've uh, completely reconstructed here. A lot of people maybe focus on that. How is the bridge construction going right now? Uh, the bridge construction is going well. Kokosin is our uh, general contractor for that project. Uh, so what we actually did is, is we had to take down, it's actually two separate bridges, uh, we saved the South Bridge, but it's really you have a northbound bridge and a southbound bridge. So we took down the southbound bridge originally. We rebuilt that. Now both directions of traffic, southbound and northbound, are on what will be exclusively the southbound bridge. And we have demoed half of the northbound bridge, the south half, and we have then built that half back. And our next step is essentially demoing the north half of the northbound structure and then building that. And once that's done, uh, the, the bridge will be complete. So I would say, you know, we're 75% of the way done because we're almost done building that south south half of the, the northbound structure. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, it's it's uh, that's kind of in the critical path is the bridge more than anything else. So 75% done with the bridge, but then you have that north and the south span. Just to get it out there, people want to know when is this going to be done? Uh, we're talking, is it sometime in 2023 for all of this to be done or could it take longer? Yeah, really, I think you're going to see, as far as the driver uh, is concerned, you're going to probably see at the end of 2023. So uh, fast forward a year from today, plus a couple months, uh, you'll you'll be seeing things wrapping up. You'll be seeing all the lanes open, the interchanges open. There's going to be punch list items like there always is. But essentially, from a driver perspective, that's when you're going to see things complete. We're with Pat McCauley from uh, ODOT. And Pat, this has been a huge project. How do you think drivers have been handling this? You're doing this construction while still maintaining traffic. It's such a busy area, especially for trucks. We know drivers aren't the most patient these days. How are they handling it? And you always have this message, be safe for our workers out there, right? Yeah, exactly, Tim. Um, they're handling it in stride. I mean, I, I don't I can't sit here and say everybody loves construction because I'd be lying to you. Uh, right. Most people don't. Uh, but the great thing with construction is that once it's done, it's hard to imagine the road without it. And that's that way going down to Finley, uh, driving on 75. And it's going to be most certainly that way going in, in through Toledo. So in parts of Toledo on 75, there's over 90,000 vehicles a day going on some of those segments. So that, that's a lot of traffic. Um, it, it, so, yeah, it's going to make a big difference. Uh, the safety of our workers is, is certainly paramount as well. We're trying to we're trying to have an increased focus on that. You're seeing variable speed limits and things like that out there, uh, but uh, we also try to protect them with barriers. But we, we do ask people to to slow down in a work zone and pay attention in a work zone uh, because people's lives are on the lines. But yeah, I, I do think the the drivers are handling things in stride, uh, but they will. Uh, you know, I, I, it's it's some short term pain. Uh, for some very long-term gain. Uh, they built the interstate highway system in the 50s and 60s. Right. And now we're making some some substantial improvements to it uh, to last another 50, 60 years. And obviously the, the biggest reason you do construction or reconstruction is to increase the safety. We know you want to get rid of some of the curves in one stretch there. Is that the biggest thing? You just want to make this a safer drive. You're not going to eliminate every accident, obviously, but if you can reduce even one, this is worth the money. Yeah, I mean, it, essentially, it's creating a safer and more reliable system. That, that's our goal. And most importantly, like you said, Tim, is safety. Uh, some of those examples are we have a weave correction just south of the bridge, and that's where they, they move the curve over. 
some of them is right on the bridge. So you, when you got off of Miami Street and went northbound, for example, or, or a number of other directions, you had to merge over really quick into two lanes of, of traffic. And that's going to be corrected with this new project. The new bridge will actually have three through lanes and we'll have an add and drop lane. So that add drop lane is, let's just say you're, you're coming off Miami, you're getting into that add lane. It's also a drop lane for South Avenue, but then you can, you can merge over, you can speed up, merge over into the through traffic. That allows it to be more reliable because instead of slowing down traffic and creating crashes, which creates traffic jams and maybe even secondary crashes, that enables that through traffic to keep moving and, and take care of some choke points and bottlenecks through the Toledo area. And Pat, one big uh, recent development on the I-75 project was the opening of the Anthony Wayne Trail to the southbound 75X that I know I, we work downtown, downtown Toledo, anyone else who does or maybe goes to a Mud Hens game and they're trying to get to say Rossford or Toledo or Perrysburg or Finley. This is a much better way now. And as, you, as, you, as I noticed, it is so much easier to get on 75. You can see it so much better. Yeah, it, it really opens some things up. Um, so we, we opened uh, that on July 28th. So recently I drove on it Saturday. Um, so that's exciting. It's been two years since we've had that uh, ability to, to get into and out of downtown Toledo off, off the uh, trail there. Um, so we actually, the only last segment remaining is the northbound trail, the northbound 75, and that'll actually open August 22nd. Okay. So really that entire interchange is going to be fully functional uh, within a matter of a couple, a week or two. Um, and so hey, we're, we're very excited about that. I think the area is excited about that. Uh, so there's been a lot of pain that went with that, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's going to really open things up to downtown Toledo and, and the Toledo area. Great to see progress being made. So drivers just be a little bit more patient until next year and it'll all be done and it'll be much easier and safer to drive through. Well, Pat McCauley from ODOT, thank you so much for joining us talking about the I-75 project. You guys are doing really tough work. Good job out there. Thank you very much, Tim. It's a pleasure being with you. All right. And we're going to be back on Leading Edge coming up. It is an eyesore in Toledo and the site of a real tragedy for one family. But that building is finally coming down. Stay with us. Welcome back to Leading Edge. We have more now on a big effort to take down what's really become an eyesore in Toledo. We're talking about the old Rosemary Apartments building, and it turned tragic in 2016 when a Whitmer High School student, Joshua Sorrell, was in the building with some friends. He fell down an elevator shaft to his death, and ever since then, the family has tried to get that building to come down. So have many city and county leaders, and we may be at that point now. Joining me is Lindsay Webb. She's the chair of the Lucas County Land Bank, playing a huge role in some big news in recent days. Lindsay, this building, this Rosemary Apartment building is going to be demolished. How good does it feel to hear that and to know that? It's really gratifying for me. I um, represented the neighborhood that Josh grew up in uh, when I was on Toledo City Council. And I made a commitment when I ran for treasurer that I would make it a top priority. And so to actually announce this um, was really meaningful for me to be able to spend time with Josh's mom and sister and dad um, and announce this meant more to me than um, almost anything I can think of in my um time uh, serving the public. And the other thing is that I love about this is the fact that um, because Wade was an, and started the land bank, he really understood what we needed to be able to do. The and so the city lent its uh, nuisance uh, police powers, limited police powers to the land bank so that we could effectively cite this building for 60 pages of violations of, of the code. Yeah, I was going to ask you, this took a long time for this for this to get to this point. Was it frustrating for Mayor Kapsikavich, who used to be with part of the land bank there and kind of got this kick started? Was it frustrating for you then when you became chairman that we need to get this down? Why did it take so long? What were your hands tied? Were county leaders and city leaders hands tied? Well, that's very interesting, right? Um, my role in as the county treasurer is that I am able to use my foreclosure powers when necessary to help abate nuisances and 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 move uh, uh, 
property along. In this case, um, you know, they were current on their property taxes uh, for some of the time. And so my hands were tied effectively, but we all know that the building was in terrible shape. And so Wade, uh, in his role, at, he sits on the land bank even today, we talked about how we could uh, effectively do this. So um, we basically have cited them for all of those nuisance problems that we found. Um, and the, the, the remedy is to tear that building down. And then once we tear the building down, we have to uh, attach the cost of the demolition to the property. Um, and the demolition is not going to be insignificant. Um, that building literally holds up the street. So um, now we are in the process of talking with, um, you know, demolition contractors who can handle this work and can understand how complicated it's actually going to be. Um, because it is holding up the, the road. It is an entirely brick structure built in the late 1920s, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and some people talk about what a beautiful building it is, and I agree to some extent it might have been that way at some point, but, you know, I had a birthday this year, and I can tell you that going back 30, 40 years, nothing positive happened at the Rosemary Apartments, um, and Josh's death um, was tragic, and my heart goes out to his family, and quite frankly, I've talked to a lot of people who have said to me, Lindsay, uh, but for the grace of God, that could happen to me. That could have been my child. Right. No kid thinks when they're playing with their friends, even if they're taking unreasonable risks, that they're going to lose their life. What um, was it like, Lindsay, to, I don't know if you were the one who informed the Sorrell family, his mom, Carrie, and his sister, Sarah, who've been so outspoken about this. What do you think it was like for them? Or did you see it in their faces when this announcement was made that it was coming down, that this is finally going to happen? I think the most meaningful thing was um, there's a neighborhood activist who's a pastor in West Toledo, and he had helped raise this issue on social media. And I asked George to reach out to Josh's family, um, and he did so, uh, Pastor George Williams from City Light, Light Church. Um, and when we told Josh's mom that the date of our press conference to formally announce this was July 26, she practically started crying oh. because it was Josh's birthday. Mm -hmm. And so um, that was especially meaningful because, you know, she described, um, you know, sometimes having to get off of I-75 and you can see the building there. And for her, it's, it's a giant tombstone. Um, right, it's and, the corner of uh, Detroit and Phillips, so a lot of people see that, including the family. Yeah, and I, you know, so I, I, we had some lengthy conversations about the fact that that is in a floodplain, so nothing can ever be built there again. And it's not so much that the Ottawa River is a flooding hazard there, as much as it is. Um, in my time on city council, I can tell you West Toledo has serious flooding problems. And so if we have high volume rain events, like we are seeing more and more, um, the, the chances are decent that um, West Toledo will continue to experience significant flooding problems. And so having green space that can absorb the water from large rainfalls is going to be really important for the city moving forward. And, and that is what I know will happen to this property, correct? It will be a green space. You can't do a whole lot with it. That's right. And so Josh's sister is studying biology at the University of Toledo. And she expressed to me that her and her mom had really used the garden and gardening to help heal. And so we talked about, you know, doing some natural plantings and that sort of thing together um, as a way to really mark that. And I know Teresa Morris um, from District 6 Toledo City Council has expressed that, you know, she would like to consider naming that Greenway um, after Josh. And I and I do think that's appropriate. That would be an amazing uh, uh, memory of him for sure. And Lindsay, we know these things don't happen overnight. You said we're with Lindsay Webb, obviously, a Lucas County treasurer and with the land bank. You had said that there's a lot going on in that property. It kind of holds the whole road up. This doesn't happen overnight. So when could we see that demolition happen? Are we talking next year? Could it be this year? 
It probably won't be this year. Um, there, my guess is that there's going to be some asbestos remediation that needs mm -hmm. to take place. And we have to get a qualified demolition contractor who can really handle this degree of a project. It's going to be very expensive. But I suspect by spring or summer of next year, uh, we'll have the building down. And the cool part is, and you know, is that finally. Um, you know, the state government has recognized that these commercial structures are holding back neighborhoods and, you know, that are vacant and abandoned. And, um, you know, we announced earlier this year, um, bringing down the Elm Street warehouse as well, where um, Cindy Sumner was found. And so um, I think this is important for the community. And I think this is important for our future. It's hard to see what the path forward is for our community when there's these kind of structures in the way. And so I see my job is setting up the future um, for our community and bringing these structures down is an important part of that. Well, you've done great work as well as your many colleagues and all the fighting for over the years to get this building down. Good to know the old Rosemary apartment building will be demolished. Lindsay Webb, thank you so much for being on the leading edge with us on this and for all the work that you've done. We certainly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And we will be back here on Leading Edge. Stay with us. Welcome back to Leading Edge. It is back to school time, and that means teachers all over the area are getting ready to welcome their students back to the classroom. But we found one teacher in Perrysburg that has classes outside of school and she's being recognized for it in a big way. I welcome in now Amy Boris. She is a teacher at Hall Prairie Intermediate School in Perrysburg. She just got back from Washington, D.C. from winning the Presidential Innovation Award. Amy, congratulations. Tell us what they recognized you for. Thank you, Tim. Uh, yes, it was quite uh, an experience in Washington, D.C. So the award is a joint award through the White House and the EPA, and it recognizes um, outstanding work in environmental education. And obviously, they, it proves that you can win an award from Perrysburg, Ohio. What they really noticed, Amy, was you're teaching inside the classroom, but especially outside. You have really a lab. It's a collaboration, I believe, with uh, the Toledo Zoo. Tell me about yes. this lab right there in Perrysburg, right behind the school, right on the side of the school. And you really get the kids involved, don't you? Yes. Yeah, so five years ago when Hall Prairie was built, this was old farmland. And I collaborated with the Toledo Zoo to put in nearly two acres of native plants, uh, what we call a prairie. So um, prairie often evokes bison and, you know, little house on the prairie, but it's not that. It's more native plants that are um, designed to, to be here in Ohio and adapt to our weather conditions. Our super hot Julys and our super cold winters, these plants really can adapt to those. And with that living outdoor laboratory, um, I've collaborated with the Toledo Zoo and they've shown our students and I've worked with our students how to collect pollinators, how to identify plants, how to figure out the importance of those plants. And we do get outside as much as possible which kids love. They don't want to be sitting uh, at a desk all day, right? <laughs> Absolutely. So during the pandemic, when we were in masks inside, it was a great place where we could take a mask break because we could be socially distanced and outside enjoying fresh air. So uh, the kids really enjoyed being out there. The prairie has um, lots of purposes. It ties into some of my research that I've done on Lake Erie and our algae problem. In 2019, I had the opportunity to be on the Lake Guardian, which is an EPA research vessel. So I brought that information back um, as a Great Lakes certified educator and tying that into the prairie and how these native plants are keeping excess nutrients out of the Maumee River and out of the lake. And Amy, your students are also tracking uh, butterflies, I believe, and different insects that are really help pollinate things. Do they get a thrill out of that? Yes, yeah, so we use what's called citizen science, where it's everyday people helping scientists gather data. Um, so they tag and track monarch butterflies on their journey. We also use something called um, iNaturalist, where we catalog plants and insects and animals that we find, as well as bumblebee watch. So I uh, teach the kids how to collect bumblebees, little tiny vials, and to really study them and figure out which species of bumblebee they are. And Amy, this is a time where we're hearing about teacher shortages all over the country. Some teachers after the pandemic have moved on. What is it that brings you back every year? I know it's a challenge and, and obviously they, they recognize you with this award, but is it the kids that bring you back? Is it a couple of different things? So I obviously have a passion for nature and outdoor 
myself. Um, I'm on the Maumee River and hiking and biking uh, all the time. And I really just enjoy sharing science with kids. And science is just learning about the world around you. And so once they understand that and can really just get out into their own environment, even in the classroom, figuring out how the world works is, is really what science is. And I do enjoy that with kids. And I look forward to having a new group of fifth graders starting just next week. Yeah, time is winding down for that. And, and obviously, real quickly, in about 20 seconds, you want kids to think about a career in education, right? Whether it be teaching about the environment like you are or in other parts of science. Yeah, absolutely. Teachers have such an important role with students and helping them to grasp onto that love of learning. And, you know, absolutely, they should look into a career, either in STEM or education. Absolutely. We, we need them, don't we? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. And real quickly, anything new that you have planned for students that you can share with us or are you going to surprise them? Well, you know, last year uh, I took a group of kids out on the Maumee River and we cleaned up marine debris, which is just trash along waterways, um, before and after the walleye run. I'm looking forward to doing that again, getting kids out into the environment, cleaning up their streams, um, and just getting started with a new group of kids and to really share all the great things that um, Perrysburg and Hall Prairie Intermediate has to offer. Well, congratulations again, Amy Boris from Perrysburg Schools. Thanks so much for being here. And great to talk to you about this. We'll be right back here on Leading Thank Edge. Thank you, Tim. My thanks again to all our guests here on Leading Edge. I'm Tim Miller. I hope you have a great rest of your weekend.